Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, more U.S. sailors are suing a Japanese utility for radiation exposure. And the city of San Diego has a new website devoted to open government. We'll tell you what you can find on it. And a decade after the U.S. invasion of Iraq, we take an in-depth look at the financial and personal costs, especially on Camp Pendleton Marines and their families. Then our conversation about the book American Umpire, why the author says it's time for other countries to take over for the U.S. as the world's police. I'm Peggy Pico. Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Another group of sailors from the U.S. Ronald Reagan are suing over radiation exposure at Fukushima. They claim they got sick from the meltdown at the Japanese nuclear plant in 2011. Sailors on the Reagan helped victims of the earthquake and tsunami. It was home ported in San Diego at the time, but is now based in Washington state. The suit claims the utility company provided inaccurate information about radiation exposure. 800 Japanese residents have joined a class action suit against the Tokyo utility company. A San Diego congressman wants to award congressional gold medals to former Navy SEALs killed during an attack on the U.S. consulate in Libya last year. 42-year-old Glenn Doherty and 41-year-old Tyrone Woods were from San Diego County working for a private security firm. Duncan Hunter says the men ran a half mile toward gunfire and were heroes. The gold medal is the highest award Congress can bestow on a civilian. You may have heard the phrase Sunshine Week, but it has little to do with the weather. It actually refers to a celebration of open and transparent government. And today, the city of San Diego becomes more transparent, launching a new section on its website. KPBS reporter Claire Tregesser joins us from the News Center. So how can we find this website? Well, the website can be found at san diego.gov slash opengov. And we also have a link on our website, kpbs.org. So, Claire, what does it actually have to offer the public? It has announcements about upcoming public hearings and agendas and minutes for city meetings. It also has some data for the public, like lists of pension payments to retired employees and city construction contracts worth more than $25,000. And is any of this information newly available? No, not really. Uh, most of the documents were already on the city's website, but Mayor Bob Filner says now it's easier to find them all in one place. And Filner also says they're hoping to add more information to the website, including his daily schedule, but only if they can work it out with his security detail. KPBS reporter Claire Trageser. This month marks the 10th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Peggy Pico takes a look at the financial and personal cost of the war, especially on Camp Pendleton Marines and their families. A decade ago, President George Bush launched the war in Iraq. The mission, he said, was to keep Saddam Hussein from using weapons of mass destruction. The weapons were never found. The war has cost the U.S. and Iraqis lives and treasure. 4,400 American troops lost their lives and some 32,000 more were wounded. There were more than 104,000 Iraqi deaths. Health care for surviving veterans could reach as much as $700 billion, making the total monetary cost of the war more than $1 trillion. Tony Perry, San Diego bureau chief for the Los Angeles Times, is here to talk about the role of Camp Pendleton Marines in this war. Tony, welcome back. Now, Tony, um, this war of course, was very personal to a lot of San Diegans because of Camp Pendleton. How many Camp Pendleton Marines uh, served in Iraq? Tens of thousands, hard to figure. Uh, totally, the uh, First Marine Expeditionary Forces, 42,000, 80, 80% served, uh, many of them multiple times, so do the math, a whole bunch. And then, of course, we have the casualties, 345 Marines and sailors from Camp Pendleton dead, 115 sailors and Marines from 29 Palms, dead, 10 times that number wounded. First conventional troops into Iraq, the Marines from Camp Pendleton, where they were greeted by the SEALs from Coronado who were there in a clandestine fashion. This was a, a local war. 
both the assault on Baghdad and then later the grinding war in Anbar province, the home of the Sunni insurgency. To us in San Diego, because of Camp Pendleton, it was not just an international story, it was a local story. Absolutely, and very personal, and you had personal experience. You went to uh, Iraq with the troops several times. What was your experience like there? Well, I was always with our troops uh, from Camp Pendleton during the assault on Baghdad, and then, of course, the fight in Tikrit, and then the fight, the grinding fight, the first one in, in Fallujah. And so while I have no political view, whether it was a good or a bad war, that's for the the historians and the think tank folks to decide, uh, I have no views on that. But what I have views on is the young Marines and the young sailors. They are a terrific, terrific bunch. The greatest generation in all that, World War II, not going to knock those folks one iota. This is as good a generation, I believe, and others believe, too. So if I came away with anything, I have no views on the politics or even uh, how to proceed in the modern world. But however we proceed, you can bet that the Marines and the sailors from Camp Pendleton will be there and they will acquit themselves honorably and fiercely. You were with these Marines, I think, seven times in Iraq, but of course you've been dealing with them forever And as far as the, the course of this war. What kind of long-term effects of this war are you seeing as far as Marines and veterans and their families here in San Diego are experiencing? Well, we're seeing it all here. Uh, there's no place in the country that has more uh, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans than here in San Diego County. Uh, PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, divorce, you name it, we've seen it here. Lots of good work being done both at the Naval Medical Center San Diego, at the Veterans Affairs, and then a lot of private groups that are, that are, uh, that are pitching in, uh, some of them publicly funded. A lot more to do, and of course the unemployment issue, the suicide issue. As you suggested in the opening, the cost of this war is going to be with us for a long, long time. Now, what was the benefit of it? Well, that's, that's what we're debating right now. Saddam Hussein is gone. Uh, he will not be attacking an American ally like Kuwait, or he won't be threatening Bahrain. He won't be fighting Iran. He won't be throwing Scud missiles at Israel or developing uh, uh, terror camps to go into Israel and blow up buses. He won't be brutalizing the Kurds. Those things he will not be doing. But what does that mean in the overall geopolitical? I wish I knew. Well, and that still doesn't change the effect on Marines and families Indeed. here and in, in, in fighting that war. Now, the last U.S. troops left Iraq in December of 2011, formally ending this war. What can you tell us about the situation right now? Well, what we have now is a shaky third world government with areas of the country it doesn't really uh, uh, control and with uh, volatile politics and with terrorism on an almost daily basis uh, rather increasing. That's not unlike a whole bunch of places in this world. No indication, however, that it's going to launch wars against its neighbors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the country was on its last legs before the U.S. got there in 03, 30 years of a dictatorship, a ruined economy. It looks even worse now. Okay, we are out of time, uh, L.A. Times. Tony Perry, thank you so much for talking with us. My pleasure. Underage drinking is a problem in San Diego and across the country. Studies show kids who took their first drink before the age of 18 are 65 percent more likely to become alcoholics as adults. Research also shows parents play a significant role influencing their kids. Hoover High School students Judith and Angelica are literally the poster kids of a campaign to prevent teens from getting alcohol at neighborhood markets. Basically, we want to get the word out that it is illegal for adults to purchase alcohol for youth. So this is just another way of like approaching the parents and like asking them to be aware of like um, if it's legal or not, which is not. <laughs> The Latino Youth Council worked with businesses, law enforcement, and elected officials in City Heights for a year to launch their reusable bag campaign. The message is simple in any language. Gracias. Don't serve alcohol to minors. Actually, within a two mile or two and a half mile, we have 10 elementary school, two middle school, and one high school. It's not unusual for kids to wait outside a neighborhood market to convince an adult to buy alcohol. It all started with us. If we are a responsible operator, then we will avoid all the other problems out there. Preventing young people from consuming alcohol is not a new message for Murphy's Market. Stickers like these are a constant reminder. 
The store owner says they have safety systems to prevent selling liquor to minors. Each time I uh, scan pack a cigarette or, or, or scan bottle of wine, liquor, beer, it asks me, have you asked for ID? I have to answer yes or no. But the bigger challenge may be convincing adults to stop enabling kids. A Mothers Against Drunk Driving study shows nearly one out of 14 say their own parents supplied them with liquor. And a survey done by the Latino Youth Council found four out of 11 adults approached by teens agreed to buy alcohol for them. Personally, I see it around school a lot that students would just have a bottle of get, uh, Gatorade, but it, would, it wouldn't contain Gatorade. It would contain some sort of alcohol. Now, the Latino Youth Council hopes to encourage other supermarket chains to join their anti-drinking campaign. Efforts to improve student health in Chula Vista elementary schools appear to be paying off. KPBS education reporter Kyla Calvert tells us a 2010 survey found nearly 40 percent of the district students were overweight or obese. Recess is just one way Chula Vista students can be healthy and active today. Since 2010, the district has promoted gym time, ended unhealthy treats during the school day, and removed chocolate milk from lunch menus. Superintendent Francisco Escobedo says health professionals told him not to expect instant results. Typically, it'll take five to ten years to change the, the, the behaviors of society. Look what happened in two years in Chula Vista. In 2010, 25 district schools had obesity rates of 20 percent or higher. A second survey this fall showed those rates dropping at each grade level. Overall, about 3 percent fewer students were overweight or obese this year. Rice Elementary Principal Ernesto Villanueva was enthusiastic about piloting district policies at his school. We've had a wellness fair. We've had cooking classes. We've talked about it. We've changed the way that we uh, even do our fundraising. But things like giving up popsicle and nacho fundraisers weren't always popular. Those things we got kind of a little backlash about, but on the whole, I think that, you know, the outcome, you know, when we're able to see results, okay, look, we you know we made these changes, but look at the results that we've gotten. You know, it kind of pales in comparison. She's impressed with the difference the small changes the school is teaching students can make. That you can run in the morning and there's a Saturday for at lunch that you, that you can eat healthy. District leaders say there's a ways to go, but they're on track to a healthier future. Kyla Calvert, KPBS News. There's been lots of construction activity downtown around 16th Street. San Diego City College has been constructing six new buildings, and today the second one opened to the public. KPBS video journalist Katie Euphrat gives us a look. It's five stories tall and 85,000 square feet. In fact, City College had to buy an entire city block to build the new math and social sciences building and its seven-story parking structure. And uh, deal with residents, eminent domain, and a very, very complex undertaking. But as you can see from the students and their pride, it was well worth it. I'm currently taking a class right here in this new building, and I love it. The classes are bigger, so more space, including for myself because I'm in a wheelchair. Overall, this building has helped me become a successful and better student. The ground floor houses a bookstore, a convenience store, and a corporate education center with large meeting rooms. The top four floors are packed with classrooms and offices. The $81 million price tag is paid for by taxpayers. It's part of Propositions S and N. The college is adding six new buildings and renovating eight more. They hope to increase enrollment from 18,000 to 25,000 students by the project's completion. This was an idea we had you know, a decade ago, and here it's a real thing. And walking around the building this morning and talking with students and how excited they were about being in facilities that they say, this is just like an Ivy League university in terms of the quality of the facility. So I feel spectacular. Katie Euphrat, KPBS News. The military defense budget is set to be cut by more than 30 percent because of sequestration. Peggy Pico speaks with a professor who makes the case other countries should pick up the slack. The Pentagon operates more than 1,000 military bases in foreign countries, plus another 4,000 bases here in the U.S. My guest, Elizabeth Cobbs Hoffman, professor of American Foreign Relations at San Diego State University, argues in her new book, 
American umpire, that it's time for the U.S. to reevaluate the cost and responsibility of policing the world. Elizabeth, welcome. Thank you. You've written sequestration cuts are actually an opportunity to talk about why we're, quote, still fighting World War II. What do you mean by that? Well, we often say, why are we still in Iraq and Afghanistan? But the fact is, we're still in Japan and Germany. And these are bases that are left over from a commitment we made at the end of World War II, which was to rescue a world that was broken, uh, that was bombed out, and that was busted. And we did that. But uh, it's time now to, to let that world take on a new dimension. To, to shift a little bit, now the Pentagon estimates our foreign military bases cost about $22 billion a year. Independent estimates uh, say that's much, much higher than that. Is your book about uh, basically the money, what we can save, or is it about sort of the shifting role that you were talking about? I think it's both. Uh, the book is a history book, and I start with George Washington, I come all the way up through Barack Obama. But what it does is it says that we, take, we took on a specific role for a specific reason, and to the extent that those reasons no longer pertain, we need to look it out, out for ourselves financially as well. The United States spends almost 5% of its gross national product on, on defense. Countries, other countries spend a fraction of that. Japan, it's 1%. Uh, UK, it's 2%. France, it's 2%. So we spend quadruple, triple, double what others do. It's not right. And, and you suggest we could maybe cut some of that spending by pulling military uh, bases or, or our presence in, particularly you said Japan and Germany. Why those two countries? Well, those were places where we set bases because at that time, Germany and Japan were considered renegades. They had to be watched. They also had to be defended. But we no longer need to defend the French against the Germans or the Germans against the Russians. And we probably shouldn't be there. Um, we just saw a, a cover of your book, American Umpire, and the title of it lends to this idea that, you know, our allies maybe should start being an umpire as well, um, helping to pick up the cost and the re responsibility of policing the world. Do you think any of our allies would be willing to step up to the plate? Oh, pardon the pun on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that they have. I think the French are doing more. The British have done more. The Canadians are doing more. I actually uh, met the Canadian uh, foreign uh, uh, Minister of Defense, and he said, you know, Canada is on top of some of these issues. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a truism that good leaders develop new leaders, and that's important for everybody's interests. Uh, what's your response to the argument that cutting back on U.S. bases either threatens our national security, international security, or it gives the appearance to our enemies that, ah, eh, we're not so concerned about you? No, I, I think that it's possible to give a very different message in relation to all that. I think that we can s say with confidence that we performed this role and done a very good job considering how unprecedented this role is, but that it's a part of the role to let others take up some of the slack at this point. And I think that that's a good message. Do you think the Pentagon or Congress will hear that message? Do you think this is something they would actually um, relate to and say this is an idea and support it? Well, I mean, I think we've seen the beginnings of that even in the last election with people like Ron Paul questioning the basis. But I have to tell you, I've gotten a tremendous amount of feedback from former military personnel who say that it's time. We've been doing it, and others really need to take up some of the, some of the burden as well. Practically, what the, would be the next steps? Well, I think to just think outside the box, to understand that we had a specific role, that it's time for that role to shift, and, and to begin thinking in terms of cutting back on the percentages. That will force others to come up uh, more to the mark. And you wrote in the New York Times that you thought China could also step up to the plate. Um, how so? Well, for example, in the current situation in North Korea, the only country that has a real control or real influence in North Korea is China. Now, China's new best friend ought to be South Korea. They're the ones that they have a lot of ties with. If something happened to South Korea, that would be a big chunk out of China's economy. So China has a lot of interest in making sure that North Korea you know, resolves its differences. And really, the Cold War on the Korean Peninsula needs to come to an end. And, and it sounds like you're talking really about diversifying um, sort of all the allies as far as not just having the U.S. have this strong presence uh, throughout the world, but this diversification. Do you think that improves our, our standing in uh, foreign countries as far as uh, foreign relations? I think it does because I think that one of the things that's harmed the United States is the perception that we do this because we're power mad and, you know, we, we think arrogantly that we're the only ones who can provide this kind of service. So I think in many ways uh, the United States will always be one of the largest, wealthiest economies in the world. We don't need to prove it and reprove it all the time. All right. We are out of time. Elizabeth Cobbs Hoffman, professor and author, thank you so much. Thank you.
Some once depleted fish stocks in the Pacific Ocean are bouncing back. KPBS reporter Susan Murphy tells us that could mean an economic boost for San Diego's fishing industry. Seven populations of bottom-dwelling fish, like rockfish, have returned to healthy levels after a near depletion in the late 1990s. A Natural Resources Defense Council report credits the 1996 federal fisheries law that protects stocks from overfishing. Fred Huber has been a fisherman off San Diego's coast for 30 years. He co-owns three fishing boats out of Point Loma Sport Fishing. He says he's noticed a significant comeback of rockfish. We've gone, you know, probably close to 20 years um, where we've only seen a few, few per trip. Um, but yesterday, as an example, we probably had close to 60, 60 olive rockfish in our count. Huber says he's excited about the future, but will continue to be conscientious in preserving the ocean's resources. Last year, U.S. commercial fishermen saw their highest landing since 1994. Susan Murphy, KPBS News. San Diego Opera is hosting a first-time event Saturday. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando sits in on a rehearsal of Cruzar, the first mariachi opera. The San Diego Opera wants you to throw out any preconceived ideas you might have about what opera is. Because these days, opera can be this. Or this. Or even this. My favorite part of this whole process is when that band plays on stage for the first time, as they were about an hour and a half ago. They were, they were doing their sound check, and hearing them in their full glory is always just, you know, it's, it's, it's so exciting. Exciting because it marks the first time the San Diego Opera is staging a mariachi opera. Yes, and the reason is there is only one. This is the very first. It premiered in Houston. They were the ones who commissioned it. It all started with the music of Mariachi Vargas. Once the artistic head of the Houston Grand Opera heard them, he commissioned Cruzar La Cara de la Luna, a mariachi opera. That's where director and librettist Leonard Foglia came in. Well, the, the only directive I was given was, I'd like to create something that would have meaning for the Hispanic community in Houston. I knew right away I wanted to tell a story more from the Mexican point of view than from the American point of view. My character is Diana Velasquez, and I am the American-born granddaughter of the main character, Laurentino. When we start out, we see Laurentino basically on his deathbed. At first, I, I worried about being the one writing the libretto, not being Hispanic. But, you know, my, my heritage is Italian, and my father came over from Italy, and I'm first generation. And once I hooked into remembering a lot of his sense of displacement and his sense of always longing for the old country, that I really grew up in that kind of environment myself. Because the powerful thing about it is it does touch on cross-border issues and who are we? If we come from another culture and we're born here or if we're from another culture and we choose to live here, do we change? Are we different people? The question for Foglia was, are we telling a very specific story or one that also has universal appeal? His answer came when he took the opera to Paris. The moment I knew that it was more than just uh, a border story here in the United States was we had um, our final dress rehearsal and one of the executives, uh, the head of the Châtelet in, in Paris, a woman came up to me and said, I just want to let you know that um, I brought my children to the dress rehearsal because I thought they would enjoy this music. And when I went up to them afterwards, they were with their nanny, their nanny who was Croatian, and said so the nanny was in tears and she said, oh, did you like it? And she looked up and said, it's my story. And I, I guess maybe the melding of the Mexican-American story and my own father's Italian-American story, I, I realized that it, it's reaching a little bit beyond into more universal territory, which is what I had always hoped. And it does reach a different audience. And there are many people coming to these performances of Cruzar who have not set foot in the Civic Theater before. We already know that. The two Saturday performances are on the verge of selling out. For Wheeler, the attraction is about blending bold innovation with familiar themes. It's just about family, and I think we can all relate to that. It's just a family story, and it's, it's really beautiful. San Diego Opera's Cruzar has two performances tomorrow. Go to sdopera.com for more information.
I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. How the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency regulates toxic chemicals in drinking water, plus Shields and Brooks. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. We're headed for a gradual cooling trend as we head into the weekend. Mostly cloudy along the coast tomorrow, upper 60s. Warmer with more sun inland, upper 70s tomorrow. Partly cloudy and chilly in the mountains, near 40 degrees on Saturday. And if you're looking for heat, mid-90s tomorrow in the desert. In tonight's Public Square, an unusual art exhibit made from 4,000 white supremacist propaganda books came to San Diego this week. The exhibit, Speaking Volumes, Transforming Hate, includes art like a Holocaust survivor framed on words of hate, a hate book caught in a mousetrap, and a reworked Confederate flag. San Diego's Anti-Defamation League sponsored the work to mark the ADL's 100th anniversary. Opening night included a remarkable speech from a former neo-Nazi recruiter, turned author. Speaking Volumes is on display at the God Health Gallery at the Lawrence Family Jewish Community Center through June 6th. When this story first aired, KPBS said many of us would like to think that hate groups in this country are a thing of the past. But Mission Accomplished responded on our website with, you'd have to be living in a shoebox to think that. You can comment on any KPBS story by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, or email us at publicsquare at kpbs.org. You can find tonight's stories and download the KPBS app all on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great weekend.